It is November 12th, 2024, and the cabinet picks have started rolling in just one week after the election, as everyone is keeping an eye on Trump to see what he is going to do. His first cabinet pick, UN ambassador. In this case, he chose Elise Stefanik, who is so pro-Israel that she makes Nikki Haley look tame. Then you've got his national security advisor, Mike Waltz, also notably extremely pro-Israel, extremely anti-Iran, and very hawkish on China, which I have a number of questions on how some of these Republicans think it's going to go if the U.S. really wants to take on China in anything from a direct conflict to even just a proxy war in Taiwan, but okay. But you also have claims that Trump is eyeing Marco Rubio for his secretary of state. As we know, that would just be a horrendous decision against what a lot of Trump voters wanted when they went and when they chose his name on the ballot. So it raises a number of questions. What is Trump actually going to choose? Are we going to be stuck with nothing but neocons in his cabinet? Could there be some surprises? Well, I got into all of the latest speculation with a special guest earlier, so let's take a listen to that conversation now. Joining me now to discuss is Garland Nixon, a journalist and political analyst. Garland, thanks so much for taking the time to join me. Thanks for inviting me, Rachel. Now, I'm glad I get to talk to you today. I know that there is a lot going on and a lot of speculation surrounding the new Trump administration, even though we still have a couple of months until they become official. But there was a lot of hope, of course, among Trump voters that he was going to do things differently this time, you know, that he'd learn the lessons of John Bolton. I know that he came out over the weekend and he said, don't worry, my cabinet won't include Mike Pompeo or Nikki Haley. But then he comes out with his first appointee for his cabinet, and it's Elise Stefanik for UN ambassador, who actually makes Nikki Haley look tame when it comes to support for Israel. So are you surprised? Give me your reaction on what we've learned so far. I'm not at all surprised. A couple of things. My first thought is there's some transactional stuff going on. I suspect that when that Trump's already struck some deals. And one of them might be $100 million from Miriam Adelson. So I tell you what, I'll give you the UN. You know, those things happen. So um, that's probably my suspicion. Now, the, the thing to keep in mind, not to attack Trump or defend, just to try to evaluate, right? Here's the reality about the UN ambassador. They have no power at all. The UN ambassador, the, basically the secretary of state or the, or the president calls him and says, all right, on, uh, you know, whatever that's up there, we're voting this way, thumbs up or thumbs down, right? So they, the UN ambassador communicates the policy of the president. Now, that being said, the UN ambassador is there amongst people so they can work to stab the president in the back if they want and do all kinds of unseemly acts. So, you know, um, but we also know that Trump has a strong Zionist leaning. Um, so I suspect that Stefanik is there, uh, I'm guessing, as, as a deal or something like that. The UN ambassador doesn't really worry me or concern me, per se. It's a mouthpiece for more than anything else. I'm waiting to see what the people who are the power brokers look like. Now, so far, I think what we've seen is some kind of an ongoing psyop, right? Because it's, we hear Mike Pompeo is going to be a part of it. And Mike Pompeo, it's guaranteed Mike Pompeo. And Trump comes out, comes in, hey, you're not choosing Pompeo or Haley. So then we hear Marco Rubio for sure. Then Marco Rubio is the guy and all of the uh, Pump Trump supporters go bananas. And Tulsi Gabbard comes out on Twitter and goes, ah, no, that's just, he's not choosing Marco Rubio, right? I don't know if it's true, but, but I just saw it on Twitter, right? So now I see some guy who has, you know, a few followers breaking news. Donald Trump's going to choose Lindsey Graham for Secretary of Defense, right? So <laughs> I suspect that there are trolls and or CIA operatives that are like, hey, what can we do to really rile up the MAGA people? Let's just keep every other day. We'll throw out a name of the worst possible neocon we can, and we'll have them all jumping and stewing in their own juices, and we'll cause mayhem amongst the MAGA people. So well, let's get them started saying, Trump turned on us. He lied. He's really a neocon. I will believe when Trump says, Rachel Blevins, she is the Secretary <laughs> of State, that's when I believe it. Until then, there's a lot of trolling and CIA operations going on, so I'm not buying into that stuff.
That is true, and that's fair. And hey, I, I don't know if I could really take on Marco Rubio, it seems like, if he's got that job. But yeah. you're right. I mean, to me, I'm sitting here going, if you're choosing Marco Rubio for Secretary of State, there's something seriously wrong with this cabinet, with the decision making. I mean, maybe that $100 million check from the Adelsons, maybe that does go pretty far. I guess it remains to be seen on that one. But I did think it was interesting, too. One of the people who there's been a lot of talk about, specifically for national security, Security advisor. So, you know, the new John Bolton is yeah. Mike Waltz out of Florida. And when I was looking into him, because I know they've all got this in common when it comes to the possible Trump picks, they're all pro Israel, anti Iran, and anti China. Well, Mike Waltz is actually one of those who is also anti Russia in the sense that he thinks that the US should be doing more to help Ukraine, more to put pressure on Russia. So I was actually surprised to see that he was would be in this spot of being chosen for national security advisor because of everything that Trump has said about how oh, he's going to come in and end the war in Ukraine in 24 hours. So how do you view kind of the upcoming Trump administration and where they actually could stand on Ukraine, all psyops aside? You know, I look at it like this. Um, I'm really, I, first of all, I want to see who's secretary of state. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the big one because the last couple of secretary of states look historically, right? People don't as much remember department of defense or department of anything as secretary of state. So to me, until I see who's secretary of state, I, I, that'll tell us what direction Donald Trump is going. Now, the assumption would be he's the head of an empire and the assumption would be Imperialism is the uh, is going to be the menu of the day, right? So, but I, I'm that's the one I'm really holding out for. Okay, he's a national security advisor who goes from country to country and talks to people. You know, who's landing on the ground in country X and talking to the people there and saying what's what? Because the people that have really done damage over the last couple of years, major major damage, Mike Pompeo and now Tony Blinken, two sociopaths. So I would have to say, you know, you would expect whoever's from the Defense Department, Mike Esper, uh, what's the guy's name now? Uh, the Defense Secretary? Uh, Lloyd Austin. Oh, Lloyd Austin. So it's a mm -hmm. safe bet that the person came from Raytheon because we seem to have a Raytheon to Secretary of Defense pipeline. I want to yeah. see the Secretary of State. That's the one that tells us. If I had to bet, I mean, consistency is the safest bet. And the, the bet would be there'll be neocons everywhere. And then Trump will struggle with the neocons. The big, this, this real stupid thing about Trump choosing neo, neocons is they'll stab him in the back. Is that he's going to, as soon as he says, well, you know, perhaps we should talk to Putin. Doesn't he remember that the last time he was like on a phone call and then all of these people that were literally in the room with him testified against him to get him impeached when they knew it wasn't going to really get him thrown out, but they knew they could use that to ha hassle him. So will Trump choose someone else that this time will either help to get him impeached? Well, he can't get it. Won't get impeached with the Republicans, but help to give something for the deep state to try to take him out and the media to crush him. I don't know. He may be that stupid. I don't know. But I I I'll say this. Here's what's important. The MAGA people and the non-MAGA people, the clothespin voters who put their uh, a, a clothespin on their nose and voted for Trump. A lot of people think it's about Trump. It ain't really about Trump. They wanted something different. They voted for Obama. They wanted it with Obama. It was, they were like, oh, they voted for a black guy. No, they didn't. They voted for something different. They didn't care wh who Obama was. He gave them a story that you're going to get something far. You're going to get peace and you're going to get. The, and they said, they were voting for this guy. Trump mm -hmm. is the opposite. Trump's a guy who doesn't come across as a polished, great orator and all these things that Obama, you know, the nice guy and all that that he played. Trump's not playing that role. He comes across as a crash, kind of belligerent, crass, kind of belligerent guy who's a little rough around the edges. People don't care about the messenger. They want somebody who's going to deliver them something that they want. They want their money to be spent in he spent here, not all over the world at war. And if Trump delivers that, they'll be behind him. What Trump may not understand is if he goes the neocon route, they will reject him like a Cub Scout in a singles bar, to use an old trope. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that that's a fair argument. And it's interesting, too, because exactly as you were saying, Americans always want the guy who's going to take on the establishment, right? They, they look at, well, 
they look at someone like Kamala Harris and right now she is the establishment, right? And so they're going, okay, we don't want that. We want the guy who we've had four years to kind of forget about Trump and him being part of the establishment. Now we see him as anti-establishment. We're going to vote for him. And of course he's promising, hey, I'm going to end the wars. He's ending his campaign by going, I want to see peace in the Middle East. And then he goes and in the span of just a few days after the election, he talks to Netanyahu on the phone three times. And you've got Netanyahu bragging going, yeah, we really see eye to eye on the threat from Iran. And I'm just sitting here going, yeah, what he's really saying is that he is buddy buddy with Trump, that Trump is going to keep his Israel first policy. Is that something that you think that Americans are taking into account? I mean, I know a lot of them will just kind of explain it away and be like, hey, he's the guy who's something different. But do we really realize what we're in for when it comes to the Trump administration giving Israel whatever they want at this point where they're already committing a full on genocide? A couple of things. You know what? I don't think we have a clue what Donald Trump is going to is, is going to do, um, to be quite frank. I don't. And I tell you what, you, it, there's two things. I always again, how do we know what we what, 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 what we believe? Right. So we know they talked because neither one of them has said we didn't. And Netanyahu said, well, Trump said he just loves me. He's all everything. Of course, for internal purposes, he has to say that. For his right now, internally, Israel is so politically unstable that he has to say to the people in Israel, he can't possibly say we had any differences. Do they agree on everything? I suspect not. I have heard that Trump doesn't necessarily trust Netanyahu, which makes sense. Hey, you know what? What's the old Zen saying? When two thieves meet on the road, they know they need no introduction. <laughs> Right. So when he sees uh, Netanyahu, he knows um, who Netanyahu is. He understands who Netanyahu is. Right. So uh, I would expect Netanyahu to say, oh, Trump and I, it was a bromance. We love each other. This is the greatest thing in the world. Whether or not that happened, we don't know. Right. I'll say this about Trump's foreign policy. When Trump, go, oh, you know, first of all, we'll see who he puts in as a secretary of state. That's the one to keep an eye on. That's the one because even defense, a lot of times your department of defense, they execute. That's your soldiers. The secretary of state says, you know, causes all kinds of ruckus, says to the president, we got to attack country X. And, and then the president calls the defense secretary, prepare to, to attack country X, right? So the defense secretary yeah, is what it is. Secretary of state is the one that we really got to got to look closely at. And now let me say this. We have no idea. Trump knows what his people want. And Trump knows, I can tell you this for sure. When Trump gets in office, the people who voted on him expect him to deliver on something quickly. See, I think the reason Trump said the first day I'm going to get a deal with Ukraine is because Trump understands, I believe, when he gets in office, his people want something that he said, and he's got to do it quick, right? So I think when Trump comes in and he said all this, I'm the peace candidate, I'm going to end these wars, and Trump can be narcissistic. I think Trump sees that as, from a narcissistic perspective, it's good for the anti-war people. Because when Trump says, uh, you know, Trump loves to say, I've done things that nobody's ever done before. Nobody's ever seen anything like this. This is the great, right? Trump yeah. wants to come in. Now he's saying there were no wars under me. I think he wears that as a badge of honor. Nobody can do what I can do. I can stop all the wars. There's no wars under me. Well, that's a good thing that he's saying that because it, that means he'll probably try. So I'll put it like this. If Trump comes in and he's able to get these two conflicts, some kind of way rendered, the volume turned down, the shooting stopped, something, right? He will be the second coming of FDR for, <laughs> you know what I mean? For the first, I mean, his, his approval ratings will go through the roof. If Trump comes in and within a month, they're like, well, we got a deal on Ukraine. It's not, uh, but we're, they're not going into NATO. And the Russians said, okay, we'll talk. And we're going to try to calm this thing down. And the shooting stopped by the way, you're not going to get nuked. People will be like, you know, perhaps I should have voted for the Trump instead of whoever the heck I voted for, you know. But I'm just, you know, saying not me, but I'm saying that people will look at Trump and say, oh, wow, he actually did it in the war. If he's able to, the rumors have been about that he said to Israel, try to get this thing stopped by the time I get in office. Here's the thing about it. Israel's in deep and serious trouble. That would save them. They're the ones losing. 
you know, they're losing in every realm. Public relations, they're wiped out. On the ground, they're, they're getting hurt. Their economy is toast. Trump, to stop the conflict in Gaza, would be to save Israel. That's all we yeah. can save Israel. To let it go is to let them continue. You know, it's like if you've got a relative who's a heroin addict. If you get them off heroin, that's the only thing that'll save their life. You don't say, hey, have some more heroin. We've got fentanyl. It's extra strong. They're done. They're dead. They're done. So there are maybe there those in Israel and around saying to Trump, you got to get us out of this. We're toast. So yeah. we shall see. We shall see. Again. Keep your eye on the Secretary of State. That's going to tell us. A I I will. I think that's a really important point. And yeah, just the it's interesting to me that so many in the media that it's being floated around the possibility of Marco Rubio. And yes, I know that you know a lot of those mainstream outlets, as soon as they can get some anonymous source of the New York Times, the Washington Post, which is where it came from. This is the guy, Maggie exactly. Haberman. Which then, come on, if that ain't comes uh, from the CIA maybe. and all of that, it's, you know, next you'll say Trump has decided to. Uh, Get rid of J.D. Vance and replace him with John Bolton, you know, and Lindsey Graham combined. He's going to sew them together and use what, you know. That's that's fair. And so I'm curious, too, when it comes to China, because obviously for Democrats, they have Russia. For Republicans, they have China. And every single cabinet position that I've heard talk about that's even foreign policy related for Trump, they all are hawks on China. They think that that's where our focus needs to be. So I'm curious, do you think that that's just talk? Is this the next proxy war that the U.S. wants to take on against China in Taiwan? Or is this just about acting like they're doing something and they're standing up to this big bully, which is how they seem to see Beijing? A couple of things. There's an ideolo ideological issue, particularly in conservative camp, but all over. The, 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 could the conservatives be more, could the Republicans be more anti-China than the Biden administration? That's impossible. They put Kirk Campbell, who talked about Asia and said something about a beautiful symphony of death. I mean, he's a sick man, right? Now, um, I don't think Trump wants war with China. I don't think J.D. Vance wants war with China. I think they may do some boneheaded um, economic things that are detrimental to us. And I think they may not understand just how powerful and needed China's economy is and just how weak and uh, financialized ours is. But they'll find out the hard way when the voters you know, hit the ceiling if they do some of the things they say they're going to do. But I recall, let me give you an example. I recall Trump talking about electrical vehicles, and they said something about, well, China sell, it can't they sell electrical vehicles. And Trump, and Trump says, well, then they should build them here. Then they should put factories here and hire Americans. If they want to sell electrical vehicles here, then they need to build them here. Does that sound like somebody wants to go to war with China? Mm -mm. Absolutely not. <laughs> that is nothing like nothing like anybody in the Biden administration would say. So he's saying Trump is transactional. Trump's like, we're trying to eat, man, and you, you, whatever. We, hey, if there's a, you want to sell EVs here? If there's a deal, business wise, that works for us, let's get it done, right? Don't sound to me like Trump's plans are for war. I think Trump understands that American people are furious, and whoever is in office, that they want them to say, stop spending all this money overseas and spend it here and rebuild here. I think that is the theme of the Trump's campaign. Now come out the men in the black suits with the briefcases that say, no, 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 we are an empire and we got to get out here and do this imperialism stuff. So how does Trump conflict, you know, how does he, um, what does the look, conflict look like between those in the ruling elite who want to clash with China or Russia or whoever the hell and Donald Trump, we shall see. I don't, I think Donald Trump, in what you hear him say is he understands what the people, what his voters want. Because he can talk to him. He's a French fry cook, a garbage man, one might say, <laughs> right? He understood. Again, I don't vote for Trump. I'm a lefty. I'm far to the left of all of these people, right? But my point being, he understands, I think, what it is that the people want. Whether he will try to deliver, we shall see. But I... I I don't think he wants a. I I'll put it like this. I don't think Trump wants a war on his watch. I think Trump wants to end these conflicts and then say, ha, look at me. No war is under me again. That's yeah. what I think he really wants. And it'll be interesting, too, to me to see who he picks for his cabinet and then 
how those voices are in his ear because even if Trump is up there saying, I don't want any wars, we know that here in the US, we have a full on establishment that does want all of the wars and uh, they know exactly how to work someone like Donald Trump. So it'll be very interesting to see, but I really one appreciate it. One, one other thing I want to add that's Iran. This is my guess, pure speculation. So Iran said something, uh, uh, he, so Trump said something about all of these sanctions on Iran and he's been against sanctions. Here's what I think. I think Trump has or will or intends to make some kind of a deal with the Adelsons and the Netanyahu's of the world to say, I tell you what, stop the war. We don't do a war and we'll go after Iran with sanctions and we'll go after them in non-military ways. That sounds like something that Trump, Trump would do, right? So that's my guess that he's going to, he knows that he can't get those people to turn the volume down. And he's going to try to say, I'll use other means to go after Iran if we can get the shooting stopped. Because he knows people really want the shooting stopped. And then who knows what will he, after that, renege on that? I don't know. Again, we shall see. Well, I think his choice in Secretary of State, again, that's going to tell us that point. That's when we can, eh, enough of these Maggie Haberman, this person's going to be in or not. Tom Cotton next, I guess. The New York Times will say Tom Cotton's going to be his guy. So that's the next crap we'll hear. <laughs> the, the next neocon of the moment. And yeah, hey, you, you never know. I mean, I guess the, the Trump campaign, or the Trump, uh, his team around him could look at this and go, hey, people really don't like it when they think that you're going to choose Marco Rubio for Secretary <laughs> of State. They're really not happy about that. And then but it'll who backfire. knows who comes next? It'll backfire <laughs> on them for this reason, on the people that are doing it. They put the most extreme name they could, right? Mm -hmm. So he doesn't have to go as far in the other direction now. When you put it out there and say yeah. it's Lindsey Graham and Marco Rubio, well, hell, anybody I choose looks better than Marco Rubio and Lindsey mm -hmm. Graham. So no matter he, how who he chooses, as long as it ain't one of those people, people go, oh, my God, thank God he only chooses <laughs> those so and so. So the setup is there for Trump to have an open hand because they said the worst possible people. And now people will be like, oh, God, anybody but them. Oh, thank God he only chose Garland Nixon. He's a maniac, but at least he ain't <laughs> Lindsey Graham. Hey, I, I feel like Tom Cotton is on that list of worst people, right? He's right up there. This guy, he's the one that introduced legislation to force the Biden administration to send more weapons to Israel as if that was something that they needed, like, a push in order to do. It is just uh That was the, the, the right wings, the neocons version of virtue signaling. Yeah. It really was because he knew they didn't need this. They couldn't send any more, but he had to make it look like, what do you want? More weapons. Well, they don't have weapon, more weapons. Well, in that case, more weapons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a, an interesting world we live in all around, but I really appreciate you taking the time to join me today to break down all of the latest here. Garland Nixon, a journalist and political analyst, thank you so much for your time and insight. Thanks, Rachel. Talk to you soon. If anything in this video resonated with you, be sure to like it, share it with your friends, leave a comment, and as always, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to keep up with all of my work, make sure that you're subscribed to my page on Substack. That's rachelblevins.substack.com. That's where you can find new weekly episodes of my exclusive series for paid subscribers called Sanctioned. You can also find Sanctioned over on my page on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash rachelblevins. That's where you can participate and regular polls and contribute to my work. As always, thank y'all so much for all of your support and I'll see you next time.